Welcome to Champion Life Center's YouTube channel. You are listening to the messages from our Guelph and Cambridge satellite. We hope you enjoy this message by Napoleon Lumise. Please come and join us for our worship celebrations happening every Sunday, 3.30 p.m. at 55 Devere Drive, Guelph, Ontario. See you then. Elevate Sunday, and uh, we're going to be commissioning for the next uh, next year uh, those that have signed up and given themselves to serve in the different ministries that we do have here in Champion Life. Um, and we want to thank you know we've we had a, a volunteers banquet here not too long ago, and there was a good number of people that came um, because they had served in one way or another and. 70, 80 percent of, um, of the congregation actually already serve in different capacities in the different ministries. And that is a wonderful uh, average, that's a wonderful percentage, and we want to continue that because we believe that one of the things, one of the, re- one of the ingredients, one of the key ingredients to growing up and, and becoming all that you are called to be and all that you are designed to be one of the key ingredients of that is learning how to serve. And if, if we don't learn how to serve, we're missing out a large portion of our individual growth and our development. And so we believe that uh, we call it Elevate Sunday for those that are asking. Because we believe that as we give of ourselves for the next year, as we commit in excellence, in, in, in passion, in, with our time, with our effort, with, with giving of ourselves. We believe that as we sow ourselves into the different ministries, as we sow ourselves into serving the people of God, into the house of God, that we will elevate in our maturity. We will elevate in our, in our giftedness. Gifts like muscles grow or sharpen as with use. And so as we give of ourselves, we believe that it's actually more beneficial, just like Scripture says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We also believe that it is actually very beneficial for us. We think that we're serving the people, and as we serve the people, that they are benefiting from us. The truth of the matter is, as we give of ourselves, it is actually us that is also uh, benefiting from that. And so our, characters get, our character gets shaped, our commitment gets tested, and, and we get to really uh, uh, test the scripture that we quote often, who's seeking first the kingdom of God. Our priorities will get tested. You know, when, when we know that we're serving, when we know we need to be here and, and there's things happening outside, it's a nice day, or there's other things that come up and get invited to different things, that's where you get to see, you know, but I already said yes to serving. I'm, I'm serving today, and Scripture says, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And so you take your will, and you submit it to the will of God, and you say, you know what? I'm going to go fulfill and do what I said I would commit to do. In that moment, in the decision-making, you're actually growing. Do you realize that? That every time you say no to certain things and yes to God, the very, the very fact that you made that decision for yes to God Something happened in you. At first, it may be difficult. At first, it may be, ah, oh, I really want to go there. Oh, it's, you know, all of these distractions, but I have to. That's the beginning stage of discipline. But from discipline comes delight, where because you're so used to saying yes to God, and now the pull of the world no longer is as strong in your life. And so what used to be a struggle to you to say no to if you get invited to a party and yet we're, we're called to be here, saying no to that is no longer as hard as it was before. Why? Because we went from discipline to delight until we get to the point where it is a desire. Where those, you know your priorities, you know I, I, want, I'm, I'm, I want to be in the house of God, I know I, I said yes to my commitments, that without even thinking twice about it, those things don't even, don't even, you know, come to mind. They don't even have to, you don't even have to think and fast whether I should be in church or not, you know, whether I should 
be committed to the ministry or not. And so in those moments of saying yes to God, in the moments that we come and say, I'm going to give up myself. In those decisions, those decisions actually shape who we are. Amen? Yeah, you, you understand what I mean? And so today I want to talk just very quickly because we want to uh, commission our, our, our volunteers today. And I have a feeling when we do that, everybody will be up here. <laughs> I think... I think it's the volunteers that came today, you know, <laughs> because you have said yes to God. Amen, right? So our big yes to God, you don't have to keep saying no to all the other things because we've already said yes to God. And so, um, <laughs> and so we, we want to, nevertheless, you know, that doesn't take away from how special this Sunday is. But, so when we, when we, later on, we're going to commission you and pray for you, um, that you will glorify the Lord in, in the way that we serve His people and the way we serve His house. As I mentioned before, when there are certain things that we do to others and for others that the Lord Jesus takes personally. He, he, he takes it. If you, if you feed the hungry, you've given water to the thirsty, if you clothe the naked, if you visited those who are in prison, those who are in the hospital, He says, you've done it. Whatsoever you've done to the least of these, you have done it unto me. And so... I pray that, you know, the, we're going to pray and, and just release you to serving the Lord as you serve His house. Today, just very quickly, I want to talk about something that doesn't really get talked too often within a congregation, a church setting like we're, we're having right now. Uh, sometimes, a lot more often, it's talked about in staff meetings, it's talked about, definitely it's talked about um, uh, sports teams and, and organizations where um, there are m multiple individuals that have to come together and, and find a way to get a mission accomplished. And, and I want to talk about teamwork today. It doesn't get talked about on a Sunday congregation setting. Like I mentioned, maybe you have a you know, strategic meeting and we talk about teamwork and, and teams do talk about teamwork. They, it's talked about a lot outside, but rarely in congregations. But there's something about teamwork that maybe we need to understand as a church, not just as a ministry team, not just as a leadership core or a sports team, but perhaps we need to kind of just open our minds and say, hey, listen, there is something about teamwork that perhaps the church is missing. Maybe there's something about teamwork that all these, you know, massive companies and all these very successful teams have something that they've been able to tap into that we as a church as a whole don't really talk about much. We don't really understand too much. And so I want to talk about just the idea of teamwork. Uh, uh, a former player once said, and I'm sure you would know probably, know who said it and who quoted it. He said, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. Talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. It would, it would be understandable if we thought it was a second tier player that said this. Somebody that doesn't really, you know, that kind of sits on the bench and you know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't think that this came from Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time. If anybody can say talent wins games, that's all you need, it would be Michael Jordan. <laughs> you know, you know, the lady's like, who is that? <laughs> but you understand, know here's a man who, who accomplished all of that, won all these championships, but he attributed the success that he had as an individual to the success of his team. The last thing you want on your team is somebody that plays for the other team. We, we used to have somebody, when we play basketball, it, it, we used to joke around with somebody, say, hey, you know what, when we were playing today, it was one on nine. <laughs> Meaning to say the other team was guarding him and his own team was trying to get the ball from him because he never passed the ball. So it became, you know, instead of five on five, it became one on nine. Even his own team was against him. You know, it, it, so it doesn't matter how gifted you are. It doesn't matter how great you are, you will never get as far as you possibly can without the help of a team. 
I know that this sounds, you know, oh, that, that sounds, you know, uh, secular, whatever. You know, it sounds, but listen, Jesus had a team. If anybody could do it on his own and didn't need anybody, it wasn't just Michael Jordan. Jesus himself didn't need anybody. But yet he chose to model for us the way the kingdom works. And that the kingdom is a body, that the kingdom is comprised of certain individuals, a group of individuals that have come together to lay down their preferences, to lay down their, you know, their pride, and to lay down their own wants and their own will and their own all of these things to say, listen, I am in it for the greater good. I am in it for something that is much greater than myself. Everybody is living for themselves in this day. It's individualism. It's about me and what I can accomplish. But listen, you're never going to get as far where you should be, where you can possibly be without the help of people around you. There is no such thing as a self-made person. Never. Even Jesus himself needed a team. And so we have athletes that would sacrifice themselves. We, hear, we, we read recently of, you know, players, football players specifically, who would play through devastating injuries, brain injuries. They would play through it. They would fake injury, they, not fake injuries. They would fake not being injured just so they can play for what? For a trophy that will eventually tarnish. They would, they, would, they would have injections in their joints just so they don't feel the pain, and they would go out in the field and give themselves. I remember playing basketball on, on teams. You, you sacrifice yourself for the, for the team. You go diving into the stands. You do all of these things for the sake of the team. We understand sacrifice in the sense of receiving an earthly reward, but we don't so much understand sacrifice in the kingdom perspective. And all of these, even professionals, put in so much work. They're working 60, 70 hours a week. They would travel to foreign lands to, to pitch their, their product, and they would sacrifice even relationships, marriages breaking down. Children don't even know who their parents are. Because they're gone, so many, they're, they're gone so much of the time. They sacrifice all of these things for a trophy that will tarnish. They sacrifice these things for their name, to, for, their, for their city name. They're playing for their city. That's why you hear so many athletes now, I'm going back to my city to win a championship for my city. They, they, they do all of these things, and, and professionals go through all of these sacrifices for what? It's for the bottom line of the company. And a company can fire you at any moment. A team can trade you any moment. They understand the idea of sacrificing for a greater good, but we don't understand it in a, in, in a, in a, in a kingdom perspective. They're doing it for a mission that will be forgotten generations down the road. We have the greatest mission the world has ever known. We have a mission that is not coming from a self-centered, I want to build my own kingdom. We're building the kingdom of God. And if they are willing to sacrifice their bodies, they're willing to sacrifice their time, their effort, their, the pains that they go through, they're, able, they're willing, willing to sacrifice families and relationships. Why do we not understand the idea of teamwork and sacrificing ourselves for the kingdom when sacrifice is one of the, one of the requirements of the kingdom of God? This idea of sacrifice for a greater good is not found by Vince Lombardi. I, I don't know if you even know who he is. The idea of teamwork to fulfill a mission did not come from Vince Lombardi who has said, individual commitment to a group effort is what makes a team, a company, a society, or civilization work. He understood how when individuals come together for a common good, for a common goal, that they become unstoppable. Teamwork did not come from Vince Lombardi, nor did it come from Ken Blanchard, who once said, none of us is as smart as all of us. None of us is as smart as all of us. I thank God that we have a good team. As a matter of fact, I need our team, our team of leaders. 
It talks about how when we come together and we pull together our, our time, our effort, our sacrifice, our blood, sweat, and tears, our heart, our passion into one common thing, it becomes this, this movement that is able to change the world. True as these statements may be, it didn't come from Vince Lombardi, it didn't come from Ken Blanchard, it didn't come from all of these great leaders, gurus of, 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 of leadership. The one who conceptualized the, the, the idea of teamwork was none other than God himself. He modeled it for us, not just with Jesus and his 12. He modeled it for us in Genesis chapter 1. The Trinity, the God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is a picture of unity, is a picture of teamwork. Individuals on their own, but one vision on three of them. The three of them coming together, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working together. Let us make man in our image. Let us make man, let us, let the three of us come into agreement and say, yes, this is what we're going to do. This is good. Teamwork was modeled through the, through the form of the Trinity. Let us make man according to our likeness, to our image and our likeness. So much so that not only did he model it as the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, this is also where we get the scripture where he says, Genesis 2.18, he says, Then the Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. It is not good for man to be alone. This is not just a scripture on marriage. Though it's very applicable because you can't be married alone. It is not good for man to be alone. It is modeled from the very beginning of Scripture. This idea of us coming together, that's why. Read through the New Testament. It's often referred to, we are often referred to as the body of Christ. We have to be connected. We have to be interconnected, interdependent with one another. Your strength will, 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 will supplement my weakness and my strength will fill your weakness and together we become one and we become stronger. And we're, able to, we're able to accomplish more together if we would just learn this idea of teamwork, sacrificing the common pleasures, the common conveniences for the greater good. God gave Adam a mission, Genesis 1, 28. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gave Adam his mission. This is what you're going to do. I want you to subdue the earth. How many of you know that that is a daunting task when you are alone? It's hard to keep the apartment clean all by myself. Imagine managing and having dominion given stewardship over the whole earth. I thank God we understand teamwork. The apartment is clean because Sam and Anna, we work together. But God gave Adam this mission. This is what you want. This is what I want you to do. I want you to steward and rule over the earth just like I rule over the heavens. I want you to be my representative on the earth, my ambassador on the earth. And I want you to make earth like heaven. So he gave him the mission. And God gave Adam his beachhead, meaning his starting point. In any war movie, there's always this one area that is fought for. Beach of Normandy and, and all of these things where, where the, the forces that are trying to come to take back the island, to take back the land, they're fighting for this one spot on the beach because they know that as long as they can get to that spot, that becomes their, what they call a beachhead. This becomes a fortified place where we can, we can plan and we can strategize and we can then take over the rest of the island. We can liberate the island. That's what we call beachhead. And so God gave Adam his mission. God gave Adam his beachhead, the, the garden. This is where it's at. And then God gives Adam a strategy. And the strategy, the strategy is this. 
It's not good for man to be alone. The strategy is bringing somebody to come alongside of him to be a helpmate, not a helper, a helpmate, co-equal, co-authority. I want to get rid of this notion that women are less than men. We were created equally in the image of God. God gave Adam his mission. God gave Adam his beachhead, his starting point. And God gave Adam his strategy, how he was to do it. He was to do it with teamwork. Why would God do that? I'm glad you asked. You know, I, I, I get, inc- I, I, Happy and I, we get encouraged when people talk back to us. It lets us know that you're awake. Right? So, I give you permission to just, you know, to talk back once in a while. That's not going to be a distraction to us. It, it, it becomes an encouragement. Just don't start a conversation. There's godly favor. Number one, there's godly favor in teamwork. There's godly favor in teamwork. There's godly favor in teamwork. Matthew 18, 19, Jesus tells them, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Anything you ask, if the two of you can agree on earth concerning anything, the ask. There's no, there, there's no clause. There's no condition. There's, there's, there's no limitation. Jesus says, if, any of, if, you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them. No condition, no clause, none of that. Why? Because it's hard enough to get people to agree. It's hard you understand what I mean? He said, if only you can agree. We worked with different ministerial fellowships in the past, and we, had, we were heavily involved with Jesus' revolution and prayer and fasting movement nationally. And when we would go to different ministries, uh, ministry, uh, uh, um, uh, the ministry circles, all the pastors of the city, we go to different cities and talk to the ministerial fellowships of the, of the different uh, cities and different pastors and all these things. And we would present the vision of prayer and fasting. We, you know, a whole day of just prayer and fasting coming together uh, and, and go on with, with, with casting the vision. And they would sit there and they would say, yeah, you know what? I agree. But that what, what that simply means is that, okay, I'm not going to oppose you. What the Lord is looking for is not for us to not oppose one another. But to co-labor, that's what teamwork means. That's what agreement means. It's to co-labor together with one another. Co-laboring means that when the right foot goes forward, that the left foot doesn't say, yeah, I agree, but I'm just going to stay here. Guess what? You're staying there. To agree, to teamwork, to, colla- to co-labor with one another is to say, okay, you go and then I'll go. So that's where we get somewhere where, where the left foot and the right foot and all of these things are, are agreeing and supporting and co-laboring with one another. If your own body does not cooperate, does not work as a team, it doesn't matter what your mind will tell you. It doesn't matter where you want to go. You're not going to get anywhere because there is no agreement. There is no teamwork. Married people, you understand exactly what I mean. Because you can say, oh, I want to go there, and the wife will say, okay, I agree, fine. You know you're not going. (laughs) Let's just be honest. Because though they said, okay, I agree, fine. It's like, I I think that's a bad idea. We should not go there. Right? But even if you're fighting for something, and I really want this, and at first they're like, okay, fine. And you you keep, you know what I mean. You keep pushing, and it's like, I really want this car, and we really need this car. and, And then eventually they'll say, okay, you know what, let's do it. All of a sudden, you're like, 
uh-oh. All this weight of responsibility. It's like, oh, should we really get it? Should I really get it now? She's in agreement, you know? And so it's hard. We're not just looking for people. We're, we're, the, the body, our physical bodies, teams, organizations, staff, nothing works unless there is collaboration, teamwork. Unity is not just, okay, you go ahead and do that. I won't oppose you, but I'm also not going with you. Unity is, I agree, let's do this together. Let's link arms for the kingdom of God. Let us expand. Let us work. Let us labor. Let us set aside our petty differences, and let's go for it. That's what teamwork is. There is godly favor when there is teamwork, when there is unity. That's why the disciples were never sent alone. Jesus never sent, he sent them, the first 12, he sent them what? Two by two. The 70, the 72, he sent them what? Two by two. Later on in the book of Acts, uh, Jesus had already gone up, but the model remained the same. Where it says that the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work for which I've called them to do. He called them two by two. You notice that when Jesus called the disciples, he found them what doing? Two by two. James and John. It's this agreement because if you can get people to agree, which is a a, a minor miracle in itself, you will accomplish so much more that the enemy hates and and it's, it's intimidated. The enemy is intimidated by agreement, by teamwork. Why? Because now my strength becomes your strength. That's what covenant means. My strength becomes your strength, and your strength becomes my strength, and all of a sudden the body becomes together, and all of a sudden the weaknesses that used to be there now become strengthened, and now the body is maturing. Now the body is standing up, and the enemy is intimidated by it. That's why he always sows in gossip. That's why he will always sow in strife. He will always sow in competition. He will always sow in doubt. He will always sow in suspicion. Why? Because if we can have these doubts with each other, if we can have these gossip with one another, if we can't trust one another, we can't trust each other, we can't co-labor with each other, we can't work as a team together, and he's just fine with that. But we'll stand in the same church, we'll sit in the same congregation, and we're in agreement with one another. Meaning I'm not going to oppose you. So the enemy wants us to be subdivided. A house, Jesus says, a house divided cannot stand. A divided house cannot stand. So there's godly favor. We need the favor of God. But it's not going to come unless we all are in agreement. Not just by word, but in deed, in heart, in passion. Preferring one another. There's godly favor and teamwork because it reflects the nature of the Father. It's how He has... See, we want something blessed. We want something to be productive. We want something to progress. And we want all these things to grow and all these things. But we're doing it apart from the model that He set for us. You understand what I mean? We, 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 We just came from a planning. And that's... Planning is good. But we need to make sure that our planning and our strategies is aligned to how the kingdom works. You understand what I mean? There are many ways that you can grow an organization, grow something. Many ways you can grow a church, but it doesn't necessarily mean it reflects how it's supposed to be done. And so we pray, oh, God, bless what we want to do. God, bless this. And, we, and God says, that's, I, I want to. I want my church to grow. I want, my, I want my kingdom to be expanded, but that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Our ends doesn't always justify the means. Or is it the other way around? Ends, the means doesn't, that doesn't make sense either. You know what I mean. <laughs> the, <laughs> the way we do it is not always, uh, let's just leave that alone. I'm just, caffeine's wearing out right now. <laughs> so there's godly favor. Oh, not, on, not only is there godly favor, but the unity, the peace that comes in unity, in teamwork. The peace that resides in a home. When we say, you know what? 
you know what, love? I don't really agree with you, but I submit to you. There's a peace that comes in a home where we know that we are going in the same direction. There's a peace that is in, in it's so, things move and, and, and grow so much more acceleratedly, if that is even a word, so much more quickly when there is peace in the home, in the relationship. It's so much more fruitful and productive. Think of your workplaces. When there's peace, when there's unity, everybody wants to be there. Everybody wants to put in the 100%. But if there is strife, if there is jealousy, if there's all this gossiping and all this stuff, everybody wants to come in just right at 859 and leave right at 401. They, they don't want to give extra. They don't. Why? Because that peace is not there, even in the home. So this godly favor rests upon unity and teamwork. I'm even reminded of how in the book of Acts chapter 2, Scripture says that the apostles, the disciples were together in one accord with one mind. They were together in agreement and they were seeking the one thing. They were all together waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I would go so far as to say that the Spirit was poured out on unity. The Spirit of God was poured out, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out when they were in unity. So secondly and lastly, <clears throat> there's multiplied strength in teamwork. Ecclesiastes 4, 19, 4, 9 to 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? The one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. Helen Keller once said, Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Helen Keller, who was visually impaired, could see the wisdom in teamwork and the foolishness of trying to be the, and the foolishness of individualism. Even a blind person could see the wisdom in unity, in teamwork, and the foolishness of individualism. Individual, no, I'm not saying individuality. You don't lose your individuality. We're together as one, but you remain unique. You remain you. There's no one else like you. You retain your individuality. But individualism, this idea of I don't need anyone and I'm not willing to help anyone. I'm going to go about my vision and what I want to do and do. I don't. That is not kingdom. I'm just telling you now, it is not reflective of the kingdom of God. And if we, if we, if we want to walk our Christian lives on earth that way, it's going to be a very rough road. Two can stand enemies again. Two can stand. Two cannot be overpowered when they are attacked. Alone we can do so little. Together we can do so much. Old Testament scripture. <clears throat> we don't have time to go through that chapter now, but you know you're familiar with the story of Nehemiah who was tasked, burdened by God, given a vision, a burden by God to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. Now, if we know, even just now, the city of Jerusalem, that can be quite a daunting task. But yet, Nehemiah, Scripture says that all the volunteers, all the laborers, when they caught the vision for rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem, set their hearts to work. And when they did that, when they understood 
teamwork and unity and the favor of God fell upon them. It says that Nehemiah built the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. 52 days he accomplished. That's less than two months of rebuilding the walls. And this was under attack. Enemies were coming to mock them. Enemies were threatening to, to attack them. They had to fight. They had to hold the weapon with one hand and build the wall with the other. 52 days because the favor of God was upon them. They accomplished something that naturally would not have been possible. But because the people gathered and rallied around a vision, caught a burden from God, and they set their heart to work. They accomplished what, what nobody else would have been able to do. <clears throat> God created us to be co-laborers in His kingdom. We're designed in such a way that we would be interdependent with one another. Nothing is impossible when a group of individuals come together and work towards a common goal. There's a story in Genesis 11 we, of the inhabitants of the earth, descendants of Noah, coming together. And they came to a plain and, and they said, you know what? Let us build a tower for ourselves that we could make a name for ourselves, the top of which will, the top of which will reach the heavens, which is an evil thing. God didn't want that. But because they were united, because they were of one vision, of one language, this is what the Lord said, 11, Genesis 11, 6 to 7. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. That's where we get the term babbling. Stop babbling. What are you babbling about? You're babbling again. That's where we get the term. It's from the Tower of Babel. It's, they were together. They were united of one voice, of one mind, of one heart, of one vision to do something wicked. And God says, if they, can, if they stay united... They're going to be, nothing will be impossible for them. And he's saying this in a negative way. What would happen if we as a church, what would happen if you and I, with one voice, one vision, one heart, one passion, one goal, expand the kingdom of God, grow the body of Christ, raise up sons and daughters, touch our city, touch our nation. What if we together, if they were able to, if, if they had the capacity and the possibility of, some, of doing something like that and it was evil, how much more can we do when we work together as a team, as one, God's favor being rested upon us? I wonder what that would look like. I wonder if the world has ever truly seen a body of Christ so knitted together, working with each other with one vision to expand the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven.